Let us take a moment to unite once more in prayer. <clears throat> Our loving Father, there is a sense of awe and wonder on our heart as we gather around your word. We know the responsibility that is placed upon us, not only the preacher, but also the hearers of the word. And we would falter and fail to properly preach or even listen to that word unless we are under the ministry of your blessed Spirit. We gather therefore now to confess our need and to call upon the name of the Lord, that we will know the visitation of the Spirit to guide us into truth and to guide truth into us, that we might be very conscious of the power of your presence and your glory in our midst. Our desire is that Jesus will be honored in our worship. In our Savior's name we pray. Amen. For a, a short time this morning we're going to return to this 18th chapter of John's Gospel. And before we leave the section where Jesus is before Annas, the former and continuing high priest, we want to note one significant and important thought that, in a sense, declares a theme that runs throughout the Scripture. And it has to do with the rod of God. And in order for us to glean uh, an appropriate application of the teaching, I've titled the message today, A Prod from the Rod of God. And uh, all of us at various times and in various ways need that little prompting. And uh, very often, I've no doubt, we can identify it in our lives. Now, last uh, study, we considered the contrast between hearing the word and receiving the word of the Lord. And, and th this is an area that was discussed yesterday in our Bible conference. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And we discovered that faith opens the ears of the deaf. Today we want to take a little look at the reaction, as it were, to the response of Jesus as he is questioned by Annas. And um, you'll see that up in uh, verse 20 in particular, <coughs> where having been asked about his disciples and his doctrine, Jesus replied, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. And in that response, which immediately invokes and provokes a very deliberate action on the part of the officer in verse 22, where he feels uh, that Jesus in some way has insulted the high priest and he retaliates by striking Jesus. We want to notice that the, the basis of this decision and this conclusion comes from the direct application of the life and the teaching and the ministry of Jesus. And notice how this comes out, particularly in verses 20 and 21. Notice these key words. Jesus said, I spoke openly to the world. I also taught. And then in the last part, and in secret, I have said nothing. And verse 21, 
Ask those who have heard me. So you note the emphasis is on the speaking, the teaching, the saying, and the hearing. All have to do with the word. And our brother David brought that out very clearly in his message yesterday. There were, no doubt, many astonishing and outstanding signs and wonders by which Jesus was known. And many of them explained exactly who Jesus was. We have in John chapter 6, for example, verses 4 to 14, the feeding of the 5,000. And remember, Jesus continued with that theme by teaching about the bread that comes down from heaven. Verse 38, I am the bread of life. We have um, th those others that were mentioned in the message yesterday, where uh, Lazarus was raised from the dead, and Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And where the woman at the well, I remember she was uh, told that Jesus could give her water that she would never thirst again. And so all of these illustrations through the Gospel of John are indicating that Christ was known by the wonders or the signs that he gave, but the signs would always lead to a revelation by and of the Word. So the signs were an indication of the strength and the truth of the word that Jesus spoke. So now when before Annas he is questioned about the work, the ministry that he has been fulfilling, he responds by simply referring to the word. He could have spoken of the man at the pool of Bethesda, who was raised from his invalid condition of 38 years. He could have referred to the man born blind that caused a great stir amongst the religious leaders in that he received his sight at the word of Jesus. We could remember many other illustrations, but Jesus focuses on the word that was spoken. Now, there's a reason for that. Come over into Luke's Gospel, chapter 4. And uh, here we have Jesus in the throes of uh, ministry. Great crowds have now begun to follow him. They are desiring some clarification, some sealing of their thinking that is, their growing awareness of what Jesus says and does, and they now want to uh, have it confirmed in some greater way who Jesus is, and so they listen to every word. And now, in the synagogue, verse 16, in Nazareth, on the Sabbath day, Jesus, verse 17, and we'll begin to read, was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Now note, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Note the key words, verse 18, the first part, anointed to preach. The second part of verse 18, anointed to proclaim. 
Verse 19 again, to proclaim. Verse 21, he came to fulfill these prophetic instructions and command so that in verse uh, 22, they marveled at the gracious words that proceeded out of his mouth. It was the word that he came to proclaim that now creates that impression of who he is and why he has come. Now come over into John's Gospel and let's pause for a moment at verse 8. As uh, John brings us through the, the work and the life of Christ and points to the various relevant aspects of his revelation from God. In John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So here again he is reminding us of the value, the significance, the importance of his word. We cannot be a child of God without the application of his word. We cannot live the disciplined life of a follower of Jesus unless we come under the teaching of the Word. It is the Word that quickens. Now come back into Psalm, Psalm 107. Psalm 107, let's read verse 19 and 20. Speaking of the children of Israel, and if you go through the psalm, you will see that it is a, a psalm of thanksgiving. Look at verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And all through, verse 8, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness. Verse 15, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. So they have witnessed the works of God. But come now into verse 19. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. So the mighty acts of God are the assurances of the promises of God made real in our hearts and in our experience. He met their need by sending out his word. It is the word of God that heal, heals, delivers, and saves. Now come back into John chapter 18. John chapter 18 and verse 21. In response to the questioning of Annas the high priest, Jesus said, Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. So the emphasis once more, not on what he did, but what he said. It is the word that relates to um, who Jesus is and what he has accomplished in the world. And so, Anna, Annas, the high priest, had he known the word, had he observed, had he absorbed, had he paid particular attention to the teaching of Jesus, would have known what his doctrine really 
was. Come over to Luke chapter 24. Luke 24. And uh, <clears throat> we'll read through verse 13 to uh, verse 31. Luke 24. 13 to 31. Now behold, <clears throat> two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. So here we are, just a few days after the crucifixion scene, the body of Christ placed in the tomb, and now the resurrection has taken place, and Christ is no longer hell-bound, by the chains of death, hell, and the grave. He has risen from the dead. He now comes into the arena of the debate, uh, which is the focus of these two who were walking on their way to Emmaus. Verse 14, And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Notice again uh, from our Bible studies yesterday um, the role of emotion and the role of reason. And, and here we have the two on the road to Emmaus who conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained, so that they did not know him. And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleophas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem, and have you not known the things which happened here? In these days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said, he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things? and to enter into his glory. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. Verse 19 and verse 27 concentrates on the word. It is the word proven that exalts Christ. 
The scriptures of the Old Testament predict Jesus of Nazareth. The scriptures of the New Testament present Jesus of Nazareth. And here is Annas, condemned already because he has not acknowledged the Old Testament scriptures, nor has he perceived the New Testament fulfillment of that word that speaks of Jesus and his word. Exasperated with all of this down in verse 24 of John 18, Annas is about to hand Jesus over to Caiaphas, who was the politically presented and appointed high priest on behalf of the Roman invasion. But before he does that, we want to and we need to observe another revelation. And here we come back to verse 22 of John 18. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Do you answer the high priest like that? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil, but if well, why do you strike me? And here is the question that we want to address for just a few moments this morning. Why do you strike me? In the uh, text, verse um, 22, you will note that the translation, uh, and it occurs both in the, the AV and the New King James Version, uh, with the palm of his hand. But if you have a margin in your Bible, you might like to take a little look at it, and you will notice that another translation is with a rod. And in the original, it is suggested that the rod is a clearer and a better understanding of the actual text. We want to just build up a, a little concept and a thought just to demonstrate the value of, uh, of that interpretation and translation of this uh, text. Some things we need to note. First of all, if you look at verse 24, you will see that Jesus is about to leave the courtroom of Annas the high priest in the same manner in which he was led in. Look at verse 24. Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. We noted that when the arrest was made, they bound the hands and shackled the feet of Jesus. It was so that he could not resist, he could not run away. He was there completely at their command and under their control. He could not in any way retaliate, nor could he defend himself. He stands bound before the high priest. It is in this position and condition that he is now struck by the officer of uh, the court. Notice secondly, being in the court of Annas, he is, strictly speaking, under the protection of the court. But he is afforded none. Come with me to Acts chapter 23. Acts chapter 23. And just look at the first uh, three verses. Here we have the Apostle Paul. Paul was a man who knew much about physical suffering for the cause of Christ. 
Here he is, once again in trouble. He's about to be brought before Felix, but en route he is brought into the high priest. Let's read verses 1 and uh, down to um, verses 1 to 3, Acts chapter 23. Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. In other words, I'm not guilty of any of these charges. I have sought to minister in the name of God and in the honor of that name. But verse 2, the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall, for you sit to judge me according to the law, and do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? Now we know that Paul has an immediate reaction, which you and I no doubt would, uh, would have as well, a little later down in the chapter, and you can read that when you go home later on today, he, he softens his approach and he mellows a little bit as he gives respect to the high priest and to the office. But here is the thought. Jesus is in the court of the high priest. The law demands that until he is proven guilty, he comes under the jurisdiction and the protection of the court. It is, in fact, a breaking of the law for anyone to strike the prisoner while he is on trial. But that didn't happen in the case of Jesus. They respond by striking him, defenseless as he stands before the high priest. For him the law is not exercised. The third thought. Look at verse 22. His uh, attacker, the one who strikes him, is not a Roman soldier, but a Jew. One of the officers, an official of the court. So what are we learning from these few facts that surround the trial of Jesus before the high priest. We are sensing here, we are seeing something of the intenseness of the antagonism and the hatred that has now been hurled upon Christ. They cannot wait to have him judged, sentenced, and then crucified. The wheels are now turning swiftly as he moves towards that fulfillment of God's plan and his purpose. So this is now a blow to the face, verse 22, who stood by, struck Jesus, and the thought there is with an intensity, with a hatred, with a venom, struck Jesus on the face. Jesus asks the question, as you have no proof of evil, no broken law by which to condemn him, why do you strike me? Now, to get the answer to two important questions, we must turn to the Old Testament. The questions are, was it with the palm of the hand, or was it, was it with a rod uh, that Jesus was struck? And the second question is, why did it happen? Jesus asked, why did you strike me? There has to be an answer, and we want to look for that uh, for a few moments this morning. Come back with me to Micah chapter 5, the book of the prophet Micah.
And let's read verse 1. In these uh, chapters, God is pleading with Israel. They have rebelled, they have resisted, they have challenged his word, and they have gone astray. But God has promised that he will restore his people. In this fifth chapter, we have a call for them to witness his uh, promise of a coming Messiah. Look at verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, Epaphra, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. What a glorious promise to give to our rebellious people. God will yet restore the glory of Israel. But let's look at verse 1. Now gather yourself in troops, O daughter of troops. He has led siege against us. That is the enemy. Led siege against us. Now note, they will strike the judge of Israel with a rod on the cheek. Who is the judge of Israel? It is Christ. When did they strike him with a rod on the cheek? When he stood before Annas the high priest. Struck him with a rod. So the question is, well, why did this happen? When Jesus stood there in John 18 verse 22, it happened because it was predicted in God's word. We have been focusing on the word spoken by Jesus, and here it is, the reality of the fulfilled word of God. Every little detail, every little part, marked out, mapped out in great detail from start to finish, from eternity past to eternity yet to come. The footprints of God over every page of his word. And the revelation of the word of God revealed to us in Christ. Now this is the first time that Jesus was smitten. But let's look back at Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26. We're going to note as we move um, further through John's gospel that this was the first of three particular trials. There are two which are the religious or ceremonial or ecclesiastical trials. And that's before Annas and then Caiaphas. And then we have the civil trial where he is actually uh, pronounced uh, guilty of sorts. Uh, not guilty in terms of the legal requirements uh, and the and the convictions and accusations brought, but guilty because the the Roman uh, the, the the leaders of the Jewish faith wanted the Romans to pronounce him uh, guilty, and so they found a way. And we'll come to that in in a few uh, weeks or months' time. But there were three trials. So at the trial of Annas, they struck him on the face. Here in chapter 26 of Matthew, he is now brought before Caiaphas. And here's what we read in this particular trial. Come into verse 67. Then they spat in his face and beat him, and others struck him with the palms of their hands saying, prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? So he is struck again as he stands in the court of Caiaphas. Now come into chapter 27, and uh, we read from verse 24. 
And here he is now before Pilate. He is now in the civil court. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather a tumult was rising. And in verse 23, you'll see they're all crying out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate took water, washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and took the reed or the rod and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him and put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. They struck him on the head, struck on the face in the court of Annas, struck on the face in the court of Caiaphas, struck before Pilate in the civil court, with a reed. Why was he stricken? Well, let's go over to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. This very well-known passage, we'll begin to read at verse 4. And I want to just uh, remind you and to emphasize the harmony of Scripture. Look at Isaiah 53, verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God. And afflicted. We're now elevating our gaze from the hand that held the rod with which Christ was smitten before Annas, Caiaphas, and Pilate. And we now see by faith a rod in the hand of God. And we read, we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. We ask why. And here's the answer. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. Peace replaces wrath. And in order for the wrath of God, which was our due, to be removed from our hearts, Christ was smitten. He stood in our place. Let's read a little more. By his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. In the garden, Jesus prayed, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. 
He said to his disciples, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Why? Because God was laying your sin and mine upon his Son. He now stands in the court of human appeal and he is smitten. But the hand of God is upon Jesus. Let's go to Psalm 89. Psalm 89. Look at verse 30 to 32. Here is God's word to his servant David and to the nation of Israel. If his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgments, if they break my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgressions with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Now come over to Lamentations, chapter 3. We have the book of the prophet Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. The prophet who cried, Oh, that my head were waters, and my eyes fountains of tears, that I might weep for the slain of the daughter of your people. And here is the lamentations, the weeping, the sorrowing, the suffering of the prophet as he sees the cities of Jerusalem and others in ruins because of the neglect and the folly and the rebellion of God's people. God has laid his hand heavily upon them. And here in verse 1, of Lamentations 3, the prophet cries, I am the man who has seen affliction, affliction by the rod of his wrath. It was predicted that Jesus would come under the rod of God on our behalf and in our place. So where does this put you and I today? Well, I want to just finish off this little thought by taking you over to Psalm 23. Perhaps one of the most well-known, one of the most loved psalms in all of Scripture, Psalm 23. But I want to read it to you in the light of what we've just considered. Psalm 23. The Lord is... My shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Just pause for a moment. How did that all come about? Because Isaiah 53 verses 4 to 6 tell me he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was laid upon him. With his stripes we are healed. And now because of that we know that God leads us as our shepherd. All wrath has been removed. Grace reigns in our heart. And I'll read verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod of God that brings penalty for sin upon the sinner brings comfort and encouragement to the saint. Why? Because before the rod could become our comfort, it was the rod of wrath upon Christ 
who took our place and died in our stead. And now the believer approaches that moment when we leave this world behind and we engage in all the expectations and anticipations of heaven. And when the cold hand of death settles upon our brow and we feel strength ebbing from our body, we know as we look up into the face of Christ, the outstretched hand of God does not hold the rod of his wrath, but the rod of his mercy. Jesus said, why did you strike me? As far as he was concerned, he was venting his anger and his wrath. But as far as God was concerned, he was revealing his mercy, his love, his grace to his people. And as we walk through these last chapters of John's Gospel, we're going to see what that journey meant as Jesus goes at last from Pilate's judgment hall, condemned by the world, but approved by God. And he goes all the way to the cross, and there he dies in our stead. Let me ask you as we conclude our thoughts today, do you know Christ? Have you heard his word? Have you believed that word? Have your ears been opened? Do your eyes see the glory and the beauty of his form? Do you recognize today that a poor lost guilty sinner coming under the wrath of God? There is no way that you can find release or pardon or forgiveness or cleansing from your sin apart from Jesus. In Romans 8 verse 1, the Apostle Paul cries out with all his being, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. It is only when you can say, The Lord is my shepherd, you will be able to say, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and staff comfort me. Will you not yield to the embrace of Christ? Today he suffered in your place. He died for you. Let us pray. Our loving Father, we thank you for these moments that we have shared around your word. We thank you that you have replaced wrath with mercy. You have given us a way in and through Christ, whereby we may know the comfort of your rod and not its wrath. Help us to recognize and to appropriate these truths so that we might rejoice in the saving knowledge of Christ and his word. We pray in our Saviour's name. Amen.